good afternoon, everybody, and a particular good afternoon to my very old friend, Elda. I don't mean that you are old. <laughs> You're not old at all. <laughs> I only uh, refer to the fact that we've known one another for a very long time. We started cooperating, working together in the early 80s, where we both partic participated in this wonderful project, XARP, the Cross-Cultural Speech Act uh, Realization Patterns Project, whatever. Exactly. Oh, Toronto. even earlier. In Absolutely. No, you were earlier. I joined you in 1981. Okay, but so it's really you know, a very, very long friendship. Like Absolutely. Friendship. Yes. Okay. But this project, as all of you must know in this room, has grown to be very, very influential. The methodology and the categories we developed were actually taken up by many people with many different uh, language pairs. And uh, so uh, we share this background. And I think right? it was initiated by you, Gabi Pastor and Shoshana Bukuta. Yes. And Elite joined, and then you and came. Later, and exactly. Later. Exactly. And uh, um, true to Elda's character that was mentioned earlier this morning, as a very uh, uh, self-effacing, not ego-denying, self-effacing, very modest, very polite, and also indirectly uh, operating person, Elda, in this, in this project, concentrated on what she then called, or I don't know who it was, mild and strong hints, which means the most indirect way of expressing things. We started, we have a scale there, if you remember, that goes from the raw infinitive down to elder specialty, the strong and the mild hints, right? And we did a lot of wonderful work on that. Later on, Elda was also interested in misunderstanding. And she has a couple of publications in the, together with Shoshana Blumkolka, our late very, very good friend. And it is about this misunderstanding that I will now talk. And I also make reference to your work in this field. OK, so here goes. This is what I'm going to do. I will talk about misunderstanding and um, make the point that, uh, as some people have said, it is both something very normal in communication, but can also be problematic, obvious. I will briefly mention the causes of misunderstanding, why people misunderstand one another, and mention ways of researching misunderstanding, how can we go about it. I will briefly present um, a discourse comprehension and production model that can be used for interpreting misunderstandings. And here then I have application of the model case studies, but for reasons of time I will only present one small, very nice case studies uh, that was in German, but I have the, uh, uh, the, the, the back translation. I will present some explanatory hypothesis for most of the case studies that we did in this project. And I will end up with my latest research, which is on English as a lingua franca, also called ELF. Okay? And what happens in terms of misunderstandings in this particular way of communicating, right? So, that generally two opposing views of misunderstanding, it can be used both positively and negatively. Shegler, for instance, talks, of, talks about that uh, talk and interaction is built for understanding on the whole effortless understanding. People basically and curiously understand one another when they should actually mostly not understand one another because everybody has a different types of history and uh, different types of prejudice and so on. Coupland uh, et al, on the other hand, talk about language use as something intrinsically and pervasively flawed, partial and problematic. Communication, in their view, is actually miscommunication. Very good. So we have a dialectic of misunderstanding, both as something good, as a resource for people, and as something problematic, right? So, arguments for either position, the concept of repair 
actually provides evidence of both the fragility of talk and the robustness of interaction between two or more people. Repair is a fundamental resource for handling when something goes wrong. It is in itself evidence of the problem of language use, because if we find it necessary to repair, it shows that not everything always goes right. Okay? Since repair is a built-in design feature of interaction, enabling understanding, or it should enable understanding, it is also proof of, of the goodness, of the soundness uh, of talk, right? Misunderstanding can reveal divergence and deficits in the knowledge states of interactants, and it can serve as a vehicle for <coughs> acquiring, modifying, expanding, differentiating, and coordinating knowledge in and through interaction. For learners in different contexts, misunderstandings can provide occasions for learning, just as in the in newer treatment of errors, errors can be seen as something positive, because teachers cannot look into the minds of learners, so they have to go by what learners, uh, sort of what the types of mistakes they, they commit, right? Eleanor Orks, famous children's uh, talk uh, researcher, says, in children's induction into a community's lingua cultural practices, misunderstandings are generally positive and constructive. They familiarize children with alternative options for sociocultural action and evaluation. This means in motheries, for instance, and other ways where mothers and child minders handle children, they usually complete their utterances or they reformulate automatically when the child makes a mistake. Doesn't the, the mother obviously doesn't say wrong, you should say this and that, but she just sort of silently corrects this, and that's a positive way of, of this sort of um, error. In L1 and L2 acquisition, misunderstanding have a dual role. They both display learners' current states of uh, linguistic uh, development, and they invite feedback, as I just said, with re uh, reference to, to L1 acquisition. Uh, it, there are certain uh, perspectives on misunderstanding in uh, developmental and, and, and discourse studies where the reproductive pro-social function of all misunderstanding is stressed. So this is again the positive view. In discourse analysis, on the other hand, misunderstanding is often exclusively seen as something troublesome, something negative, something disruptive. And this is apparent in many taxonomies of misunderstandings. The most um, well-known taxonomy is the one by, um, by Kupland et al. Unfortunately, the book is, has long been uh, out of print. I don't know why. It was seminal at the time for looking at uh, misunderstandings. We used it in our research. They um, uh, designed or worked with a number of different levels of misunderstandings, which I will very briefly review here. <coughs> Level one is where misunderstanding is pervasive and inherently in the nature of language. It, it just needs to, um, to apply, which is basically uh, a positive view. However, they go on saying that the intrinsic imperfection of all linguistic communication and the ambiguity and incompleteness of most messages uh, are taken as being normal and not seen as uh, problematic. People know that they cannot completely understand. They do something sort of they get by, right? The primary goal of interactions are not the creation of something perfect, which is uh, utopian, but to uh, avoid undue clarity, unpleasantness, threat, and confrontation by talk that is too direct. Right? Here we can refer to Elder again, who has always stressed the importance of indirectness and uh, vague language in terms of hinting strongly or mildly. Small deceptions in language, minor misunderstandings, interrupted turns and slips of the tongue are very common in any talk. The let it pass rule uh, is, uh, is observed as often as not. In other words, what this means, as you probably know, if you don't completely understand, you wait um, patiently until uh, the, uh, the, the, the trouble will resolve itself, 
right? Miscommunication at level three takes on implications of personal inadequacy. These, these are cases where people actually blame the perpetrator of the misunderstanding for what occurs, right? Poor communication skills, unwillingness to communicate, bad temper, personality problems, etc., et are attributed to people who uh, are responsible for the misunderstanding. The behavior itself is seen <coughs> as non-normal. This is a very negative view, according to some implicit standard of adequacy and often correctness in uh, linguist, uh, linguistic terms. <coughs> Level four, the strategic value of commonplace activities are seen as miscommunicative at the first three levels, but miscommunication also reflects negotiation of conversational and relational control between the interactants. The maintenance of preserved personas and the modification, identity goals, achievement of specific task-related outcomes as um, instrumental goal. So misunderstanding is something strategic. We all know this when you're in a foreign country and you're stopped by the police, right, and you actually feign not to understand. You say uh, you don't understand in order to avoid the fame. This is a strategic value where you use the misunderstanding for personal profit. Me, we do this all the time, not only when the police stops you and you pre pretend to be, I don't know, a foreigner, okay? Level five, Miscommunication uh, is seen as a cultural uh, phenomena that relies with certain mostly national groups. And it may be accountable in terms of cultural differences in behavior and beliefs. Culture is seen as having communicative consequences for participants. And the examples I will show you in a minute, actually I only have one uh, case study, and it shows how misunderstanding arises from uh, differences in as cultural conventions and language use, okay? So miscommunication then arises from a lack of understanding of the differences, the suspicion or fear or threatened identity through somebody else uh, incringing uh, on you. Now the last and sixth level relates to ideology, where interaction is seen as reinforcing or even constituting social value. Uh, what defines interactive sequences as miscommunicative ones is that they disadvantage certain individuals or groups while proposing that others uh, um, uh, are more desirable or even morally correct. Okay, now, tentative definition of misunderstanding. A misunderstanding occurs when an attempted communicative act turns out to be unsuccessful because what the speaker in, 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 intends to express differs from what the hearer believes to have been expressed. Very simple, very general. However, discovering and attributing a certain communicative <coughs> intent to any speaker is in many cases very difficult, if not downright impossible. So we shouldn't probably operate with the notion of intent, and I don't personally. Okay, now, let's look at various causes for misunderstanding in intercultural interaction. The first one at the, at the lower, at the level of perception, inadequate perception. Probably you can't hear or whatever, or you're tired. Second, in, inappropriate comprehension at different levels of language. Okay? Also simple. Third, insufficient knowledge of the world. People have different conceptions, different knowledge levels, particularly in intercultural communication, different histories. Um, next one is simple people may be uncooperative. They may feign that they don't understand in order to, not only the, the policeman uh, example, but in order to put somebody down. Yeah? Teachers do this when the power is involved, right? We don't. Elder certainly doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely. Or, on the production side, the inability to produce a well-aligned move. You can understand, but it's very difficult in a foreign language to produce something that's adequate, uh, given the conventions that hold, right? Now, what are other causes of misunderstanding, in particularly intercultural interaction? is, of course, the notion of indirectness and the hidden meanings. 
and much of language use is indirect, right? Needs to be, and it's good that it is. Different sociocultural backgrounds, diverging or overlapping communicative conventions, institutionally imposed roles. These are some of the, of the causes, right? Now, what about ways of researching misunderstandings that um, I have uh, used and my collaborators also? First of all, we have social views of analyzing misunderstanding, and here I reproduce uh, Halliday's two uh, notions of interorganismic and interorganismic perspective, which relates, of course, to the emotions and to the cognitive states of interactance, and the interorganismic, which means the social. Um, a way of uh, analyzing talk. Here we have to look at the entire context of situation, Malinowski's famous term, and the embeddedness of any language use in the sociocultural context. Secondly, we have intercultural miscommunication research, of course Gampers uh, comes to mind and other of his followers, where in much talk, contextualization cues are misunderstood. Right? There's the famous examples that uh, uh, Gampert's produced. I don't have to uh, list them here now. Oh, misunderstanding as a mismatch of frames. And of course, sociocultural differences in communicative styles in the interpretation of indirectness and of course, politeness. Now, indirectness and politeness are not the same as Shoshana bloom Kolka famously wrote in an article. I, I followed this up with reference to German and English. So indirectness is not uh, uh, the same as, as politeness. And as Elder also stated, if you are very, very indirect in terms of your beautiful mild hints, this can create a lot of cognitive uh, load for the interpreter, and he or she may uh, blame the speaker for being so obtuse, you know. So it's, it has nothing to do with politeness. However, politeness, of course, very important for any misunderstanding because it always comes uh, into play. Politeness, as we all know, a very, very basic um, social guideline for interactions. It's related to social norms. <coughs> has a, a, it's also related to something that may be called etiquette. In intercultural interactions, very important. What is the etiquette? But it's a minor point. It is also a pragmatic phenomenon that is related to philosophical maxims and uh, principles. It's related to certain speech styles, communicative uh, styles, and of course to the management of face. I have looked at and tried to unite some years ago uh, the uh, claims that politeness is something universal or it is something uh, culture specific and came up with a very simple idea that at the very low biological psychosocial level where we're all human beings and we all follow what one may call the noli me tangere, don't touch me, I want to be separate and stay away, that this type of uh, this type of uh, dialectic relates to all uh, interaction. You want to be part of a group, but you also want to be a distinct uh, individual. This is universal. It probably also affects animals. And at the philosophical level of the famous uh, Leech's maxims and principles and so on, these are certainly universal to a certain degree. However, at the, at the level of uh, linguistic cultural description, Certainly, um, uh, uh, there is culture specific, but we can unite the, the, the claims of um, politeness being universal or being culture specific. Okay? Now, pragmatic theory based uh, look at uh, misunderstandings. Here, there, we have a focus on everyday interactions between members of either the same speech community or, of course, intercultural encounters. Questions for this analysis are asked. What did the speaker say? What was he talking about? Why did he bother to say what he, oh, sorry, why did he or she say, bother to say what, she, what he or she said? And lastly, why did the speaker say it in this way and not in another way? And here we have the research by um, Elda and Elda and um, Shoshana bloom -Kulka, and they uh, analyzed interactions according to the individual I meaning 
and the collective V direction that was taken from Searle, I guess. But they applied it to the an analysis, very fruitfully, to the analysis of um, misunderstandings in interactions, right? Another view that I found particularly, oh, there, there's, the, the arrow is a bit funny, it doesn't matter. Anyway, there is a view of um, self-orientedness of communication, which means that people um, uh, are basically two separate entities, and they cannot come together. The, uh, the, the uh, simile is, is used like two dancers dancing on their own and not coming together. The self-orientedness of the speaker and the self-orientedness of communication and the concentration of on oneself when uh, people start talking. This very frequently from our analysis happens in intercultural interaction because people are not uh, in a position to throw themselves into the other person's weird minds, right? And uh, uh, on the fifth, at the fifth level, we have a psychopathological views of misunderstanding that goes back to, to Freud, famously, where we can relate what goes wrong to speakers' mental processes and states. And misunderstanding is seen as resulting from people's mindless, automatic, and non-thinking behavior. This means that um, people often think they know what the other person is going to say, and they don't even bother to listen properly. Lots of examples of people who sort of operate in their minds. This goes back to the famous research strand of ready-made plans, schemata, scripts, social episodes, etc., where people uh, have conventionalized wisdom and knowledge in their minds so they don't need to listen, or they feel they don't need to listen. And they, the, the consequence is a lack of attention to the real input that they completely ignore. Okay? Right, then we have information processing approaches to misunderstanding analysis where we start out, comprehension is initially bottom up. We have minima, minima, minimally structured knowledge systems that go to the, to the particular context and particular online structures and come to, uh, the outcome would be densely associated knowledge sets that hopefully uh, concur between the two interactions. Okay, now we come to a very brief uh, description of the discourse comprehension and production model that I have used in the analysis of the case studies we did in, in our work on misunderstanding, where we assume the existence, which is true and the literature proves it, of scripted behavior, cognitive plans, frames, schemata, episodes, etc. The model operates on two levels. One is the conceptual level, and two, the lower level, is the linguistic uh, level. As you can see here, the upper part is the cognitive conceptual level, and in the input, we, uh, the, the, the speaker somehow consults his operant discourse frame or the knowledge that he or she has for this interaction, formulates an interactional goals, comes to a current prediction, expectation of what he or she should say, decodes then the linguistic, uh, uh, linguistic structures that he or she sees, comes up with the discourse meaning and comes to the center, which I think from my research is, is actually crucial, the emotive cognitive gut reaction that people have, which however, unlike what happens when small children often speak the truth, uh, speakers normally filter this emotive cognitive reaction, have a certain strategy, what they can say, come up with a cognitive plan, <laughs> and then start encoding. Okay, and does do not go from the emotive cognitive gut reaction to speaking immediately. This is the way um, that is sort of the, the ideal, right? Okay, now what we have looked at for many, many years is a misunderstanding in intercultural university encounters. We carried out uh, many, many case studies um, at the University of Hamburg. Case studies also, in term, not, in, in ter not only in terms of um, real interactions, but in terms of descriptions and narratives of what people think happened in, in their interactions. So the data that for the, the, this case study that I'm presenting now, the brief one, is um, we looked at naturally occurring dynamic discourse, 
uh, there were a, a, a number of American exchange students, junior year abroad at the University of Hamburg, and their native German interlocutors. The methods, we've equipped them with self-recording uh, devices, which they used, and uh, afterwards we sort of pre-analyzed whatever happened and then interviewed them. This is a standard method that is used. And uh, the hypothesis was that um, because of Anglophone, I would say generally British, American, uh, Australian, I lumped them all together as Anglophone, uh, that the, the, the differences in communicative preferences and styles would cause these misunderstandings. And an emphasis uh, was, on, of course, on something that was worth looking at, namely these famous critical incidents. There's a lot of criticism of these incidents, but still, at the time, we used them. And here is one example. Um, too much rice, a very good example that has, I have been asked for the example by Helen, uh, what's her name, who worked on this, I can't think of the name. I have really... Hmm? No, it doesn't matter. Anyway, this is a lovely example. Many people thought, and this is it. I will briefly read out the... I assume that you don't understand German other than Anita and... No. Anyway, so... Uh, the, the, the little scenario is the American exchange student actually asked the uh, German, Brian, asked his German friend Andy for help with his German exam. And this Andy was helpful, it helped, and then uh, Brian um, invited him to dinner as a sort of thank you, okay? Come to dinner, you know, you'd help me, whatever. Anyway, so this is the interaction. So this is the beginning. Um, hello, uh, uh, hello, Andy. How are you? Typical um, exchange at the beginning, and the the um, Brian uh, or Andy says, um, "Fine, really fine." What is missing here, as the uh, interlocutors uh, told me, is the re reciprocation, which is standard. Something very quickly, it doesn't mean anything, but it should follow. Fine, how are you? Blah, blah. End of affair. This is typical, it's missing. Lots of people have said that, that in, in Germany, probably now it's different because everything is so international. But still, for me, when I emigrated to Canada, I always, when somebody asked me how I was, I always entered into useless, boring, unnecessary details, how I was feeling, whether I had a headache, whatever. I don't know about Israeli. Do you have this reciprocity? You don't, do you? Do you have that? Do you do now? Anyway. Yeah, but it's probably Americanized. Anyway, so this is already Marx. We can see that in box A in the model, pragmatic knowledge is different. And as we go on, this Brian, uh, the, the cook or the, the uh, the host says, everything is ready now, hope you like it, I've cooked it myself. So because and this gets interrupted and Andy says, fine, fine. And then uh, uh, Brian uh, explains the type of food and says, that's what we eat in the south. He was from Georgia and, you know, rice and whatever. And uh, then this Andy chips in and in a loud, probably impolite voice says, Oh, that's far too much rice, far too much rice, which uh, a, very, a very direct complaint about the food, which is, you can say, etiquette, but it, as I will explain later, is also uh, typical. And he goes on in the what follows, explaining uh, why this is so bad, that there's so much rice. Um, Brian then says, um, it doesn't really matter, I've invited you, I paid for it, for the, for the rice that I cooked, <laughs> right? Okay, it doesn't really matter. And then this Andy comes in and says, it does matter, it does. I think it matters, think of the poor people who go hungry and who would like to eat something like that, a little lecture, a morally uh, account. And then Brian very feebly, it's a very, on the... <laughs> He believe me, blah blah, and but he goes on this, and he doesn't realize what what go, what what happens, 
this in the common world we should all live in which we are all endowed with material goods so unequal we should at least in a small scale try to produce no waste no useless waste and then this, uh, this uh, Brian again says something feebly I don't believe blah blah and it goes on and on he keeps lecturing now what what happens is uh, in, in terms of this model there are completely different um, interpretation of this event, an invitation where one, people know in terms of the knowledge that you have, like the restaurant uh, episode, you know what you do. And in a, when you are invited, you don't do this sort of thing. A, and, and Andy apparently jumps from box B, the interaction will go right to the encoding without any uh, strategy or filtering or politeness. Okay. So, Explanatory hypothesis, this goes back to my wonderful um, contrastive German-English analysis. I say wonderful because I've done this for so many years and with many different data and uh, different interactants, etc. All German-English and I came up with wild generalizations. I have to say this rather self-critically now. But this is uh, so certainly true to a certain extent. At least when we go back to the Xar product, we found this as well. <coughs> Germans in their interactions with different people tend to be more direct. Just like the Israelis, I would say. Dugri. <laughs> okay, I was told at the time that this is true. You know, you, you often say what you think rather than filtering. Like this guy, this, uh, this Andi guy. There's a stronger orientation towards self which you could see in this example as well. It's sort of, I wouldn't say totally oblivious to, to, the, uh, to the interactants, to your listener, but somehow uh, there's a concentration of what you would like to get across in terms of the content, not in terms of minding the addresses. The, the content is important. And p the, the explicitness, of course, uh, uh, co-occurs often with uh, directness. So the Germans tend to be more explicit than uh, Anglophone speakers who, who value implicitness. Uh, I later did some research on translation of children's books, a corpus of only 52, and I found that the translations also reflect this. The, the older translations, the newer ones, are actually uh, put in, when there's small talk uh, in the children's books, this usually got uh, not translated at all, because the translator thinks children in small talk, ridiculous. In the English original, it was there. So uh, actually, these, these, uh, these contrasts also refer to the value of something like small talk, which is relatively useless, but does a lot to lubricate the, uh, the interactions, as we all know, right? So, explanatory hypothesis of this little um, case study again. Different interpretations of Gricean maxims in terms of quantity and going on and so on, and different uh, importance or different interpretations of Lakoff's lovely little politeness principles don't impose, give options, make your hearer feel good, be friendly. Sorry about the typo. Okay, so the be friendly is actually fascinated me and I tried to find out by asking what, what is friendliness, what, what is it? It's a, it's a very important type of, of um, uh, way of handling other people to be friendly. I think these are nice, very uh, informal, very early. I think 1973 she did that, where she, uh, uh, Robin Lakers did this. Okay, now also um, when we talk about differences in communicative styles, one also, one not only sh uh, should um, regard or consider the micro context, as I've just been doing in many people, but also the macro context of historical, political, philosophical, social developments, legal systems, and educational systems, and other cultural practices. Okay? There's a very different educational tradition um, in the, the German education system versus what I very nastily, nastily have called the etiquette of simulation for the British and American cultures, where you say things that you don't mean. Somebody said, not sincerity in the, did you say that, Anita? 
sincerely not in the American tradition, but really, you know. No, no, no. Oh, and you said it. And anyway, so there, there is something in the etiquette of simulation. You simulate interest. This is the whole bit about small talk. You're not interested at all in what somebody says, but you feign it. And it's a good thing. I find it a good thing. I have to learn it. Anyway. Julia, I must say something. Yes, please do. Before the first meeting of I, I joined uh, the Desar project, yeah. I came in and I didn't know what to do. It was in one of the hotels of the conference. Hotel. In, in Israel? No, no, in Toronto. Oh, yeah, in Toronto. It was with the ILA conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I looked around, I didn't know what to do. Nobody got and up. Shushana, no. And uh, now everyone was standing, but nobody was looking at me. And Shoshana came to me and she says, here, now, you meet with people you don't know, we kiss. You kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Shoshana. I didn't think so. I didn't want to. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, but Shoshana was, Shoshana was very direct, if you remember. Very. Who, who laughs? It's true. <laughs> anyway. Also, there's a man called Pierre Legrand who had lo wrote a lovely article way back in 1996. He's done further work. Actually, we invited him once for a, a conference. Yeah, I'm nearly finished. Don't move. Whatever. And he's, he claims that the legal system, there's a famous, I don't know what, what is your, do you have the American model or do you have the, the English? British. What? British. British. The British. Oh, so you're also one of them. Yeah. So you're the, you're the, you are the, the, you are the, yeah, interesting, very interesting. Okay, okay, but it is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a legal system where you negotiate things. It's a case law where you go back to a, a case, a cases of precedence, right? You do that, okay? In the, in the, in the German, French, Spanish and other uh, Central European country, is very different. Everything is fixed and you don't negotiate, you don't have these wonderful uh, American films where, you know, the lawyers manipulate stuff and whatever. So it's all fixed, you can't change it. And people, this Lego um, actually uh, ended up his article saying we should never have let the Brits into the European Union because they have this different legal system and they, you know, they manipulate everything, whatever. So there is a different, and that has, according to this man, and I think it's, there's something to it, an influence of, on people's thinking, okay? So there are different ideologies. We can debate this. I don't totally believe it, but it's a nice idea. Now, let's go come to my, uh, my final part, five minutes, sir. Misunderstanding in English as a global lingua franca. English is the dominant language today. Nobody knows this, but uh -huh, it's, a <laughs> it's used internationally in many important areas, politics, business, science, cultural, uh, and linguistics, not so important, but still. Given that participants in elf talk and also elf writing, which I've been looked at, which I've been looking at recently, come from many different lingua cultural backgrounds, one might reasonably assume that there would be lots of misunderstandings, right? However, and, and we, we, we I ran a project uh, about this, a corpus of elf interactions for, for interactants with different mother tongues interacting or taped and analyzed whether, whatever. We compared it with their native English data, interviews, etc., etc. And uh, this led to the following results. <coughs> Remarkable lack of revealed, negotiated, open misunderstandings. Very interesting, as we thought. English as a lingua franca speakers view English as a mere means of communication used totally instrumentally, right? It's not a language for personal and cultural identification, or not. it's just something that you, uh, that, that, that you use. And speakers, according to Alan Firth, adopt the let it pass principle. They wait until uh, uh, whatever is funny uh, gets disambiguated, okay? Elf speakers go out of their way not to let misunderstandings happen, given the precarious nature of this multicultural <laughs> talk. They know that it is precarious and they adapt their behavior. Speakers attempt to normalize potential trouble sources mm -hmm. before they happen, using supportive moves that goes back to this club project, such as represents and reinterpreting English discourse markers. I did a lot of work on the discourse markers that get reinterpreted by these speakers, 
but particularly frequent is what Edmondson has called represents. It's basically a, a repetition, and here is one example. Highly frequent occurrence in all the other data sets as well that people looked at, and here is the little interaction. Joy, a Chinese speaker, and you mean English is really getting important because the grammar is, uh, is very easy, and way another speaker, a uh, Chinese says, it is easy, is very easy. It's simple repetition for him to gain time mostly, represents are found to support working memory in the fast given play of the talk, creating coherence, signaling comprehension, and acting as a meta-communicative procedure. We also find a strong solidarity and consensus via the co-construction of utterances. And here's a little example. Maori, an Indonesian student, says, I think it begins, um, of course, with colonialism because the history of this development, how language in the very early period, um, and then three seconds, very long. He can't continue, apparently. Joy says, build up the base. He acknowledges, says yes joy to be a world language, and he says yes. So this is a nice little example of co-construction um, of uh, utterances. Now, finally, how can we pr uh, promote intercultural competence and counteract misunderstandings as a positive uh, conclusion here? What we need is to increase what I have a long time ago called pragmatic fluency with regard to English as a lingua franca in this case and an awareness of one's own and others' communicative strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> to reveal strategic misunderstanding in manipulative practices of deceitful talk, like the policeman, where you act as though you don't understand, you should expose this. Be wary of and counteract intentionally conflictive and confrontational talk that is often based on misunderstanding as well. Now, this is my end. Five minutes? Yes. It's okay. Over. That doesn't matter. How can we avoid misunderstanding? <laughs> Since meaning is never laid out clean and neat, it must be inferred, as we all know. And inferences in oral talk tend to be quick and automatic, which often results in misunderstanding. To prevent this, we need A, an open mind, whatever that is, and B, a type of revision mentality, a willingness to, to revise your impressions or your understandings and to delay final interpretations as long as possible. And to avoid premature judging or prejudice. To increase awareness of one's own and others' communicative intentions and needs. In other words, we have to be mindful of what people say and not assume that you know already what they're going to say. That's it. Thank you very much.